So first uh, paper is uh, sensitive detection of form proofs keratoconus and ectasia using topography, tomography, and OCT. Jack Holliday. Thank you, Dick. Good morning, all you early birds that made it in for the uh, first talks of the day. And I do want to share with you some of the new concepts that are coming down in terms of sensitive detection of one of the things in refractive surgery that we're all concerned about, and that is operating on someone that has formed thrust keratoconus. And what I'm going to do is review for you what the topographic findings and then show you what the new findings in terms of tomography and OCT. Get away from me. <laughs> OCT. So what we'll do here, here's my financial disclosures. And what we will show you here is first, in topography, there's five findings that have been characteristic for many years. And what you see here is the hot spot, the red spot that you see for the cone is almost never at 6 o'clock. It's on either side. The hot spot is round in keratoconus, whereas in contact lens warpage, it actually looks like a smiley face that I will show you. The Ks are almost always steep. That is over 45 diopters. And the hot spot is actually more than 30 microns thinner at that point than the corresponding point above, which I will show you. And it's almost always asymmetrical in keratoconus, and it is symmetrical almost always in contact lens warpage. And what you see here is an example of that. Now, on your left on the top is a refractive or axial power map, which you're used to seeing. On your right is a tangential map or local radius of curvature, and this is just a more sensitive way of seeing the detail. Same data, but a better way to look at it. So a local radius or tangential map, and we can actually see the nipple, and we see that it's round. And we see that it's not exactly at 6 o'clock. Below, we see that it's a smiley face because the contact lens drops down, and when it comes back up, it pulls the edges up, so we see the smiley face, and it's almost always exactly at 6 o'clock. Now, that's the review. The new things that have come down allow us with tomography, that is, Scheinflug, uh, the Pentacam from Oculus, the Galilee for Zemer are both devices that do this. They take cross sections through the cornea and are coaxial with these sections. So unlike the old orb scan where we take serial measurements, we have a common point to compensate for the movement of the eye during that two seconds of acquisition to put the image back together and eliminate the eye movement. It lets us get these three-dimensional images, see the front and back surface of the cornea. And as we know, in keratoconus, it's a thinning. And in fact, Bowman's and Decimase both move the same amount forward. But the epithelium that's six to eight cells thick on the front surface, as the lid motion goes across this, it begins to remove those epithelial cells so that instead of being six to eight cells thick, it actually smooths it down to make a better surface and it ends up being four to six cells thick. And the result is that it masks the changes on the front surface so the back surface is a more sensitive detection. Now, the other factor that relates is for 25 years, we've used a sphere as the reference for elevation above and below when we look at corneal data. The cornea is not a sphere. It's an ellipse is the best, foot, uh, uh, best uh, fit, an oval or a football. And because we've used a sphere, the elevation of the central cornea, where it's prolate, steeper in the center and flatter in the periphery, it's like trying to fit a basketball to a football. It's always higher in the center, and it's always below in the periphery because that's not the real shape. And it primarily depends upon the asphericity of your cornea, and in, because of the asphericity, the variation of the elevation above the sphere can be from 10 to 30 microns solely depending upon your asphericity. Now, if we fit with an ellipse, that is, the lips that best fits the cornea, the only thing that shows up is this irregularity on the surface, both on the front and the back. So when we look, for example, here where we fit a sphere, we see an astigmatic cornea, so it's, when we fit a sphere, it's got to be above the steeper surface and below the flatter meridian, so we get this band going across. We also see the power changes in the periphery, and the exact same cornea fit with a toric ellipsoid. All of a sudden, all the bands go away, and what we see here is in a normal cornea, the elevations are never more than 5 microns above that reference, whereas we were talking 20 or 30 microns before. 
So I've told the manufacturers of which these reports are becoming uh, more common that the doctor doesn't sit at your instrument. You need to provide a report for him that gives him the topography, which you see in the first column with this refractive and tangential map, the pachymetry data in the second column, and these elevations for the front and the back surface. The only new map that you've never seen is this relative pachymetry map, and what that is is it allows us to actually tell you what the thickness of the cornea at that point, say right here, is 3% higher or lower than it should be. So in every pachymetry map, it gets thicker in the periphery. But on the relative pachymetry map, it's relative to what it should be at that point, so it should be all green, and if it's a percentage above or below, it gives you that number. Now, if it's over 5% thinner at that point, it's abnormal. If it's over five, 10 microns above the toric ellipsoid elevation, it's abnormal. So when we look at these, we see, here's our tangential map, we see a hot spot. We look right here and we see a hot spot on the relative pachymetry map, which doesn't show up on the regular map. And in this case, it's over 10%. It only needs to be over five. And the elevation here is about 15 microns above. And up here, it's only about six to eight, again, because that epithelial cells on the front surface are rubbed off. So it's easier for us to pick up and determine these form thrust keratoconus than we can get with uh, using a reference sphere. Also, when we look here, we again see on this, here's our tangential map, looks green. We see this big red spot in the center, 30% thinner. This is a 300 micron cornea, post-LASIK. But when we look on the map that shows the posterior float, we see numbers that are negative, minus 13%, minus 8, minus 5, which simply means there's no ectasia. It's an extremely thin cornea, but there's no ectasia going on here, so it's normal. Now, one other technology that's doing the same thing as Scheinflug is a combination of topography, where we get the elevation data, pachymetry from OCT, where we know the thickness, if we know the elevation on the front, if we know the pachymetry, we can subtract the thickness from the front surface elevation and once again get the back surface. So this is called the Visante Omni by Zeiss, but more companies will begin to do this. So it's a combination of topography and OCT. We can generate the exact same map, so here's a normal again. And what we see is uh, normal, no reds, no rens. So this is a good one. Those are all under five microns. And once again, we see that the elevation on the posterior surface is over five microns. The percentage is over 5% thinner at that point and on the tangential map. So as soon as you get three corresponding red points, it's basically keratoconus in the form thrust. So what we see is today that with tomography and with topography and OCT, we can use the tangential map the relative pachymetry map, and the toric ellipsoid float. And with that, it allows us to do a more sensitive detection of keratoconus. And I hope with this, it helps you do a better job with your instruments to find these patients so we don't accidentally operate them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack.